stuff is things that you should look at and consider during this. And also the borders at that time period are so different that you just have to ask yourself even what city was it created in? Because the Holy Roman Empire you know, was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. So you should ask yourself what part of that it does it belong to, what modern part of the nation state does it belong to. For example, a lot of treatises that we think of as German were written in what is mod really modern day Poland, you know, in those regions like that, or southern Germany, like in what is nowadays the Czech Republic. So you should ask yourself, where in all of this was it happening? It'll help answer some questions about the dialects, too, when you try to translate these things. Which brings us to the next point. What language was it written in? Is it written in Italian, early New High German, Latin? Was it written in good Latin, bad Latin? Who knows? Depends on what you're looking at. And also, was it written in French, English? The language that it was written in and the dialect in which it was written are going to help you answer questions. Again, even if you never intend to actually translate the treatise, you're just going to take a book that someone else has translated, buy it, read it for yourself. You should be aware of some of these points because no translation is going to be perfect. And when you're interpreting a treatise and you come across a technique that just doesn't seem to ever work right? the way that you want it to, well, maybe the translator did the best job that they could with that word, but go back and look at that word. And it's helpful to know where to look. And then say, oh, you know, when he's talking about breaking the other person's guard, he's talking about getting them out of the guard or break or, or deforming their structure, whatever the context is. I'm not going to get into an argument about that. Just trying to make the point. Take note of what the language was. But the fundamental thing that sums all of these points together is that context is the king behind all of this. What is the context of the book, of the work, of the manuscript, or even of the fragment of the time period that we're looking at? That is where we're coming from with all this. So we're going to now start to look at some common pitfalls then. Now that we've looked at what I think is important when you're studying these treatises, what are some things that I think people make mistakes about all the time? We'll go through a couple of them. First one is, these are how-to manuals. And by the way, before we go through all these lists, I, if there's anybody's toes out there that I step on, trust me, I stepped on my own toes because at one point or another, I've made all these mistakes, okay? So the first one is, these are how-to manuals. Well, if you try to read Ringek with that in mind, you are going to be so lost. Because he's a glossator. He's taking a poem that was intended to confuse anybody who didn't already know what was in it and wrote down some notes for himself to understand it and help his students understand it. It's not a how-to manual in that particular case. So you have to ask yourself, again, why was it made? Who was it made for? When was it made? For what purpose was it made? You cannot just simply look at any old treatise and consider it as a how-to manual. Some of them you can. You can read a book from the 19th century. You can read you know, Colonel Monstery's uh, treatise from 1870s in Boston, that new one that's just, been, that's just come out. And it's a great book to read. I encourage you to pick it up because it's a great little part of American history. His book is a how-to book because it's written for a general audience. Anybody from, from lower classes to upper classes would buy it. It's written for ladies who want to learn how to beat off ruffians with their parasols. So some things can be a how-to manual. Some things from the 14th century cannot be. And that is part of what also separates ourselves as modern interpreters and practitioners from people from that time period. There's a different philosophy. There's all types of things. That's a whole new lecture all in and of itself. And I'll try not to get off on that. Let's go to the next one. Next common pitfall is everything I need to know is in this book. If I pick up a copy of Fabris, I can read that from cover to cover, and that's all I need to know about right here. Well, there are certain problems associated with that, too. One of the easiest which to point out is that even in that time period, you're going to have some familiarity or experience around <coughs> swords because that's the thing that people used to defend themselves in that time period. I'm not trying to make the argument that everybody carried swords or everybody knew how to fence from when they were a baby. Certainly not. But there are access to instructors. Even if you buy a copy of Fabris's book, and of course he's going to say in his own book, it's all you need to know, because then you will tell your friends to buy it too, and he can advertise it in that way. Take him with a grain of salt, because he's advertising himself. There are other treatises 
that can shed some light on things that Fabris may not have thought was important to write down. Also, there are certain biomechanical things that nobody can encapsulate in a book. It's impossible to encapsulate everything that you need to know about fighting into a book. Even some simple basic things like the positioning of the feet of the fencers and why they are the way that they are. A person can write in a book, you stand like this and that's prima. Well, the fundamental biomechanics behind why that's like prima, an instructor can help you out with or even just going and talking to a weightlifter can help you out with. A good personal trainer can tell you, oh yeah, when you line yourself up in this way, the bones do this, the muscles do that. Helps you to understand the context behind why these things are written down the way that they work. That's only just one example from me picking on Fabris, even though he's one of my favorite rapier right masters altogether. So I hope you know that I'm not biased, okay? So anyway, not everything that you want to know is in these books. That's impossible. So don't fall into that pit. The next type of pitfall that we encounter is somebody who says, and I once said this, I want to learn long swords, so I only need to really read the long sword stuff. Well, that would be true if it weren't, in the sense that I'm saying that even many of the long sword treatises, they say that this long sword weapon is part of a greater art form. You know, when Tallhofer is writing and he's saying, you know, it's great for, for men to know how to fight with long sword, messer, wrestling and dagger and spear. He wraps it all together. Many of those masters, they wrap it all together. So even if your intention is only to fence with longsword, as many people in the human community are only interested in, and that's fine to only ever want to fence with the longsword, but you should still read the parts on the dagger. You should still at least look at the parts on the spear. Because whoever this person was who wrote these things down, he thought it was important enough that you know something about the spear in order to be good at the longsword to encapsulate the full breadth of this art form that they practiced and wrote about. I should move just a little bit faster, so we'll keep going. Uh, next thing is, uh, so let's read everything that we can. You know, Meyer is the same thing as Ringek too, right? Well, the pitfall there should be obvious. For one thing, it's difficult to just read absolutely everything. That's number one. But the second part is the bigger pitfall. Meyer being the same as Ringek, and I've done that too where I'll read something in Meyer and go back to Ringek and just say, oh, well, Ringek said this, so we can do that for that thing that Meyer that I don't understand. The issue with doing that is Ringek is writing for a different audience, a different time, different context. Meyer is writing for a time period where lethal duels with sharp longswords probably didn't happen that much anymore. Lethal duels with rapiers happened a lot more, but rapiers didn't even exist in Ringek's time. So you're separated by 200 years with these two different masters, different social classes, quite probably, different backgrounds, so many things that are different. It's also frustrating, and many people have been frustrated, to try and reconcile these two different masters together, and then they say, well, I don't understand this art anymore at all. Well, you don't have to go that far. Easier just to say, hey, they were different guys. And even if they, you put them in the same room, if you took Meyer and moved him back to the 14th century, took Rangek and brought him forward to the 16th, put them in the same room, they'd still probably argue about it, just the two of them, because they're two pretty opinionated guys, most likely. So that's a pitfall to fall into. You cannot just simply reconcile the two masters together, separated by so many centuries. So the next pitfall you can fall into is to say, OK, 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 I'll just stick to the masters in that time period then. If the time period is the issue, we'll just stick there. And I would say, oh great, go read some rapier treatises from the 17th century and tell me how you can reconcile them all. The best example I'll give you of that is where the rapier master tells you to watch when you're fencing the other guy. The thing is Alfieri who says to watch the center of the body. Another guy will tell you to watch his hand. Another guy will say, no, watch his eyes. They've all got their own opinion about where you should be looking. And all of them are right because they're all historical. You can make an argument amongst ourselves today about which one is right, but we would just be having the same argument that they did 500 years ago, and that's still 100% historical. So that's the thing about masters even in the same time period, especially if they're from different countries too. Fabris, even though he's Italian, is writing in Copenhagen. Masters in England are in England, and Giganti's over there in Venice. So even the, the Physical separation is something you need to take into consideration when looking at these guys. All right, let's go a little bit further then. The next pitfall you can run into, 
This translation is perfect. I bought this book, and I love this translation. First of all, no translation is ever going to be perfect, ever, because there's idiomatic expressions that simply don't exist in our own you know, tongue. I've heard so many different people you know, give ideas and concepts about what it means to stagare a blade, or find a sword. Even the terms cavazione have so much wrapped into them. And that's just the Italian stuff. The German stuff gets even worse. Indes. There are whole articles that are written about what that word indes can mean and all of the different meanings. And you know what? All of them are right. Some of them are wrong, but most of them are right. <laughs> I tease. So the idea of a translation being perfect is one you shouldn't fall into. Read it with that grain of salt. And read it alongside a transcription if you are able to. Because in German, it is not like English that you can pick out the right words. Italian, too. So as you're going through it side by side, you can see some of the ways in which the language can be lost, and even some of the ways that the language can be brought forward with the English right there in front of you to give you an idea about what is this person talking about. So don't go into any translation and create the gospel version of what it is that you want to do, and then run with it, and then make your, and then get into a really nasty argument with your friends on Facebook about this particular technique that you're talking about. Look back at the German, and at least put those two side by side. It'll help out, I, believe me. Now we'll get to some of the last two. These have more to do with just training. Because out of all of this, it sounds like, well, I need someone to teach me before I can learn it all. You know, with all of these things that can go wrong, with all of these pitfalls and mistakes that I can make, and so much to learn and so much context, I need someone to teach me before I can learn it. Well, no, you don't. Because so much of what we're discovering is discovered by people who had no idea when they started. <laughs> And many mistakes were made along the way. That's okay to make mistakes, because when you make a mistake, you learn and you get better. And if this were the attitude we were to have about some of the lost traditions, nobody would have ever learned them to begin with. I'll use the example of Jason Taylor, who studied uh, sickle, the sickle work of Paulus Hector Meyer. In Cron, in Southern California, there was nobody who knew anything about sickle, but he just thought it was really cool to fight with sickle. So he picks up the book, it's in German, it's not even translated yet. Finds a professor of medieval history at a local university, specializes in German as it so happens, has him help him translate it. Jason spoke a little bit of German too, but as far as that historical context, it can be useful to go and seek out a professional academic's opinion. And trust me, they will want to talk to you. They want to find people to talk to them about this stuff. So you can then divulge these secrets bring them forward, get other people interested in it, get a dialogue going, get a community going, and before you know it, Sickle has reached mimetic proportions in Kron, where we now call it the king of weapons with our tongues and our cheeks. So you don't need to have someone to teach it to you before you can learn it, because that, if that were the case, these arts would still be shrouded in books that dust to a library somewhere never to be seen or heard of again. Now the next thing then, if that's what you're trying to do, is you can say, I'm so alone. Who is going to... Help me even to discover these things. And that is, again, another advantage that we have being where we are. It's 2015. We've got Facebook. We've got the internet. We've got YouTube. I can be standing here talking to you out there, giving you a perspective on all of these things. You can ask me questions. You can ask other practitioners questions. At this point in the history of HEMA, there have been people now who can say they've been doing it for 15 years. You know, who knows what HEMA's going to look like in the next 10 years, next 20 years. So nobody out there can ever necessarily need to be alone. We can all get in contact with one another and talk about these things, interpret them, discover them. It's a great time to be practicing sword fighting. So at the end of all of this, I want to give an example of fight book analysis. How, 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 what's a specific case of how to do this? So let's say I want to learn some messer. OK, first stop you should go to is the Wigton Hour. Because Wichtenauer has got so many primary sources on there with translations and images, it's ridiculous. Go to the Wichtenauer, it should be your first stop. So I'm at the Wichtenauer now, okay, what do I do next? Well, the most extensive Messer treatise is Johannes de Kuchner. You just spend a little bit of time browsing around. When you stumble on a Messer treatise that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages long, that's only Messer, yeah, that's a pretty good spot to look. But let's say that that's just a little bit overwhelming, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. So let's take a little bit further. Well, the Wichtenauer is very helpful for people doing research. 
For example, you'll find out that a later author, Hans von Speyer, he took Le Kuchner and he linked him to Lichtenauer's tradition of longsword in his own composition. I did not composition, but compilation. Again, that whole taking a bunch of different masters and putting them in the same book. And he says, you know what, Le Kuchner and Lichtenauer, they're really similar. Well, if you're already a longsword person and you know a little bit about longsword, you can follow this a bit further because in that same source, Magister Andreas, in that compilation, he directly compares Messer to the longsword and vice versa. So if you know something about longsword, you can know a little bit of something about the Messer. And here, I pick this example because it's so pretty, he takes all of the things that are the way that they are with longsword and has a direct correlation to what that thing is with the Messer. So if you know about the Zornhau with a longsword, you already know about the Zornhau with the Messer. If you know about the Thwart strike, it's got a shock strike. And again, these are abstracted translations because again, you know, Zornhau, Shiohau, they have meanings all wrapped up to them already. But we'll just look at the bigger picture of what we're trying to do here. That just with a little bit of background of the longsword, you can find out so much more about even the Messer. And now you can run with it. Now you don't have to necessarily read every single word of these hundreds and hundreds of pages, but you've got a framework to explore it, following the opinion of this particular person who wrote that down, but it's historical, and you could go with it. So use these general principles. There are many traditions still waiting to be discovered, some of them probably sitting in some monastery library in Europe somewhere that all it takes is somebody in Hema taking a day trip out somewhere to go and look for these things, and there are people all over the world still doing that. There's a whole community out there to help you. The Hema Alliance, in particular, is a very good hub spot to go and find people interested in that. There are plenty of experts right here, ready to help you. Just gotta send them a message, or post somewhere, get in touch with them somehow. They want to talk to you about this stuff. And finally, why not become an expert yourself? That's how anybody else became experts in these things. Picking up the sources, digging through them, looking at the context, and just discovering something that, you know, I hope takes the country and the world by storm some days. More and more people find out about this great thing that we do called HEMA. So are there any questions that anybody has? I put up a couple of links here. Link to the Wicton Hour, link to Cron Martial Arts, link to the HEMA Alliance. And it's easy to get in touch with me. I'm on Facebook, but if you per prefer email, miles at cronmartialarts.com, M-Y-L-E-S at cronmartialarts.com is a great way to find me. But any, are there any questions that anybody has that, or any discussion that anybody wants to have about this stuff? I like a lot of the stuff that I'm not, I've been doing it for 20 years. Okay, I figured such, if you've been in it for 20 years. All right, well anyway, so if, if any questions that people have, we can also take into the gallery. So let's wrap things up here, because it's 5.30, so we get to have half an hour to go play in the gallery. Sound fun? All right, let's do that.